All right, I guess we can get started. Uh, we have quite a few people who've joined us. Um, so hello and welcome everyone. I'm Samia Rahman. I'm a lead consultant from ThoughtWorks Chicago and I'll be your host today for this webinar. Um, this is the sneak peek webinar for the Tech Radar Volume 21. And uh, it's wonderful for all of you uh, to join us uh, from all over, I assume. Uh, we also have uh, Jamak and Sudarshan uh, to take us through the preview of this volume. Um, and I'll let Jamak introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jamak Dehwani. I'm one of the principal consultants at ThoughtWorks. I'm joining you right now from the early, foggy mornings of San Francisco. I'm excited to be here and share some of the blips that you will see in our full radar in a, in a few weeks um, this morning. And uh, Sudarshan, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Sudarshan. I'm also a principal consultant in ThoughtWorks uh, from Bangalore, India. Uh, it's a bit late, but uh, looking forward to the radar today. Thanks for joining. Um, so we can get started uh, talking about, with, ab about the tech radar in, uh, for those who are not familiar. So the tech radar is something we've been uh, gathering twice a year where most of our senior technologists uh, gather to discuss about their various projects and experiences on the various tech stacks they might have used the techniques. Uh, and there are usually four categories that we talk through, which are the programming languages and frameworks, tools, platforms, and techniques. And we uh, talk through them uh, over the various rings that you see in this radar. So uh, moving from inwards to outwards, we'll uh, talk about each of the uh, categories or uh, the blip in each of those categories and talk through whether it should be adopted and uh, whether it's uh, deemed as something we highly recommend for people to adopt and use in their projects. Uh, the second uh, ring moving outwards is the trial where we might think that it's worth pursuing and uh, it's something where we want to uh, understand how to build up that capability. Uh, and it's something you also want to keep in mind where uh, you can handle the risks. Uh, the next uh, ring moving outwards would be assessment or assessing uh, the blip and where we consider exploring that new tech stack or uh, tool. And finally, the last uh, ring where we uh, caution and recommend to be very mindful of if you end up using it within your project. Uh, and uh, just a quick overview of the uh, webinar. Uh, there is a section for a Q&A here um, where we would appreciate if you put your questions there. You can also upvote on questions that you think you don't uh, want to miss getting answers on. Um, and then I'm trying to see what else is there. I think that's about it. Uh, there's also a chat section if you want to chat about things. Uh, and that's about it, I think, on this webinar. So without further delay, I guess we can get started on our first few themes and blips. So I guess the first one is on Graal VM. And I think Sudarshan, you were going to kind of tell us what's going on with that. Uh, yes, uh, Samia, thank you. Uh, so yeah, the first blip for today is Graal VM, and it's on Assess. Um, so Graal VM is, uh, it's a universal VM and JDK by Oracle. It's based on uh, Hotspot and OpenJDK. Um, and uh, it, can, it can run applications written in, uh, of course, Java and JVM languages, because in the end it's uh, based on Hotspot. But uh, what's interesting, it's all, because of its universal VM thing, it also has a whole host of other languages um, uh, which run on it, like JavaScript, Python, Ruby, R, even the LLVM languages like C, C++. Um, 
And um, so how is it different from uh, OpenJDK or Hotspot, right? Like uh, what exactly is GraalVM? Uh, well, GraalVM has a few different parts to it. It, it has the uh, GraalVM compiler, which is a JIT compiler. It has something called the Truffle framework. Uh, it's got something called the native image and it's got an LLVM interpreter. And um, what's into, if, you're, if you're using Java or JVM language, why is it into the, what, what can you do? Well, to begin with, you can just use GraalVM instead of your normal VM. And uh, you could, and essentially what you might get is potentially a faster VM, right? That's, that's essentially what it is. Uh, and the reason, and reason it might be potentially faster is because GraalVM's JIT compiler um, is, is uh, has quite a few enhancement improvements over the traditional C2 uh, JIT compiler, which you get uh, with Hotspot. But that's that's just one side of story, right? Like one of the key things, interesting things about GraalVM is it it's um, it it includes implementations of all these other languages, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, etc. And um, it's not that this is not new, right? If for those of us in the Java world, we uh, sort of had uh, Jython, we have had JRuby, we've had implementations of other languages um, on the JVM, but um, what makes GraalVM slightly different is, is it's not straightforward, it's, it's non-trivial to implement a language in the JVM, uh, but GraalVM with its Truffle framework uh, makes it quite a bit easier to implement a language um, uh, against the framework. So you don't need to actually understand bytecode and how to translate all your language semantics onto it. You just need to work against the Truffle API and the Truffle AST and uh, you can easily uh, make your language run on the JVM. And this is interesting because now we are likely to see a lot of languages which uh, run on the VM. Uh, and this is one of the key uh, advantages because now uh, you can really support polyglot programming. We, we always did, but now there are a lot more options. You can be working on one language and, um, and if parts of it, let's say a rule engine need, is better done in let's say a Ruby or a Python or uh, some of the language you can embed it and import it and uh, vice versa and, and have more options and stuff like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's the polyglot aspect of uh, GraalVM. But there's one more aspect of GraalVM which is really exciting for a lot of people in the Java community. Uh, we all know that JVM performs well in long running tasks. Uh, but when we consider short running tasks or memory constrained environments, it's normally not as good. It takes a uh, few seconds to start up and uh, you know it has a lot it takes up a lot of memory etc GraalVM contains a component called native image um, which helps address this uh, essentially it's an ahead of time compiler you can compile uh, your program into machine code uh, where it embeds uh, a, a simple vm called substrate vm so that you get garbage collection and all that stuff uh, but what does that it it, it has a much faster startup time and it's uh, much more performant memory wise a range of uh, frameworks like Micronaut, Caucus, et cetera, have started to take advantage of it and have shown uh, impressive uh, gains. Um, so yeah, as you can see, GraalVM has a lot of different components and quite useful, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, while I I don't know of many uh, projects in ThoughtWorks using it in production, uh, I think definitely it's something to keep an eye on. It's uh, Oracle released the GA version earlier this year, so uh, we are definitely expecting um, you know, further uh, improved usage of it in some of our projects. Back to you, Samir. Cool, thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, I think one thing I forgot to mention, we will uh, pause uh, after the first set of uh, blips in uh, the theme to talk, uh, to answer some of the questions and then towards the end of the webinar as well, we'll answer some questions. Uh, so we'll continue on to the next uh, blip. Uh, and I think this one's on you, Jamak. Uh, run cost as architecture fitness function. Sounds very interesting. Yes, I'm going to throw you all into the deep end. It's not an easy one. Usually it's difficult to actually describe and get the message across around techniques because techniques are, you know, discussing approaches rather than pointing to one tool or the other. Um, and this one is a strongly, you know, kind of um, embraced with, a, with, with, with us and uh, by us and it's in the adopt ring. Um, so, you know, we, we are very much comfortable with designing architecture characteristics. So designing architecture based on different characteristics, right? We need a resilient architecture if you're, um, you know, running a, 
I don't know, financial service or health service, or I, we need to be very responsive or extensible or scalable, like this, or less, you know, have elasticity. But when was the last time we actually used run cost as a characteristics to define an architecture? Um, not, not, not that often, right? Uh, so what this flip is talking about is um, considering the run cost as a characteristics of the architecture and deciding, deciding what that range or acceptable range is. And then, you know, applying automated tests that we call fitness functions, I get to that in a minute, to kind of monitor and track and predict that over time to make sure we're still moving towards the, you know, the target that we expected to be, you know, an acceptable range for architecture. Uh, I don't know if the audience are um, familiar with the concept of fitness function, but fitness function was, is a concept that was introduced by Neil Ford, Rebecca Parson, and Pat Qua, uh, our colleagues in their book, Evolutionary Architecture. Uh, and essentially describes, it uses the kind of the, the, the concept of genetic algorithms to define tests or functions that can measure uh, objectively whether your design, your architecture is heading towards what you expect it to head. You know, if you're looking for a secure architecture, are we still, you know, running tests to say, is this architecture secure? So what we're talking about here is, um, um, you know, defining kind of automated tools and functions that can run against your architecture on the cloud particularly or infrastructure providers that are charging you for the infrastructure resources that are using and measure the the output of that function and compare it to what's acceptable um, you know particularly what has been has changed with cloud providers is that you know they, they have a very savvy pricing model um, and the arch that pricing model is not static and architecture is not static right it's not that you know i'm using that many vms and you know, statically, you can kind of calculate what's the pricing model. And your architecture has, yes, it has those static characteristics, but it also has dynamic characteristics. For example, you know, your serverless-based architecture is being charged based on API call. If you're using event streaming solutions, they're being charged based on traffic. Or if you're running you know, jobs or data processing jobs, it's based on the number of running jobs in your cluster. And as our, your architecture evolves and grows and you know, your number of user changes, that kind of the shape of that run cost changes over time. So uh, one of the things that our teams, as they get on the ground, do at very, very early stages. So it's not really an afterthought. It's very early stages. It's establishing kind of that automated mechanism to, um, to monitor the resources the architecture is using and monitor the cost of those resources over time. Um, and we've kind of tried, uh, I reached out to different teams to see how, what tools they're actually using. Um, you know, there are a bunch of like cloud optimizer providers out there that they do that for you to some extent, but their purpose is different, right? The purpose is optimize the resources that are, you're using, not so much directing your architecture. Um, and they're out there, you know, Cloud Checker is one of them. Uh, what, what our teams found actually quite useful in terms of the level of granularity you get is just using the services that the you know AWS or the cloud providers um, provide to you and then build on top of it that you know the typical observability kind of stack that you expect to see what whatever metric you're observing. Um, the examples I've been given is uh, for example AWS had a trusted advisor as a service as an online service of course, the downside with that is that you need to have a higher tier of service, like use their higher tier to get that service. Uh, but Trusted Advisor is one of them. Uh, another example was given was that for monitoring the Kubernetes cluster, particularly using the Kube um, state metrics and um, using an open source software spot price exporter um, to kind of monetize, sorry, monitor the, the uh, the pricing and on top of it, you know, have the Prometheus and Grafana, the typical observability stack to kind of be able to query and see where, how the architecture doing to, in terms of like its fitness around the run cost. Um, and we really encourage the teams to just do that, you know, when you land on the ground and when you start um, kind of building the architecture and growing the architecture over time. Um, there have been many incidents of like surprises that, you know, you design something and it's, you know, it's, 
it's wonderful. There's like so many, the proliferation of services that are out there on the clients. Like you just want to, in a kid in a candy shop, like pick whatever great new service that is out there and you just wire this thing together. And the last end of the month, you, you know, you, you receive the, the cost and that can't be surprising over time. So I, uh, I pause here if there are any questions around this. No, it's something I think uh, at least I'll be at least introducing in my project uh, that I'm working on right now. It's something I've seen we've suffered the consequences from. Uh, so I don't think there are any questions on this. So moving on uh, to the next uh, blip, it's uh, Pumba, I believe. Uh, Sudarshan, could you tell us what that is? Interesting name. <laughs> Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so uh, Pumba is um, a tool in Assis, and um, it's a chaos testing and network emulation tool for Docker. Uh, for those who have been following uh, the radar, we've had quite a few chaos engineering related blips uh, in the radar over the last few editions. Um, and uh, of course, the poster child of chaos testing is um, Netflix's uh, Simeon Army tools. Uh, but apart from that, there have been a few other tools which have been popping up as well. Uh, the previous radar, for example, we talked about Jepson, which is a, a tool for testing distributed systems by introducing chaos within its uh, um, within the distributed system itself. Um, one of the things we are finding is increasingly we are we are building more complex distributed systems. Right, we are not building simple applications, and and um, resiliency is becoming as important an NFR as performance or security or some of the other NFRs we typically spend a lot of time and attention on. Um, and uh, consequently, uh, testing for it is becoming uh, a very important thing as well. Um, now, some projects that I'm aware of have started in ThoughtWorks have started to have stages in their pipeline uh, dedicated to chaos testing, which, um, you know, just like you have stages for performance or security or so on and so forth, you would actually have stages for chaos testing and resiliency testing as well. Uh, so in this context, uh, Pumba is a tool which can help us. Uh, how is it different from, uh, let's say, uh, Chaos Monkey or some other tool where uh, not that most of our applications have containers in some form or shape. And when you use um, some of these chaos testing tools, they are working at the wrong level of abstraction to really help us. Uh, they are working at perhaps hosts or um, you know at, at that level of abstraction. So uh, Puma is a tool which actually works at the level of containers, and um, uh, you know in in in, uh, in the context of containers, Puma can help introduce chaos by helping um, to sort of schedule randomly terminating containers, starting, stopping, killing, pausing, so on and so forth. Um, it can also uh, introduce network effects, uh, like tinker with the network in terms of delaying, creating loss in the packets, uh, duplicating or reordering packets, etc. Uh, they do this by uh, using the traffic control tool on uh, Linux, so uh, they're able to uh, impact the containers that way. So uh, the, the way we've sort of I've seen seen it being used is um, during development phase you can use it locally with Docker Compose uh, probably more to test the network effects and stuff like that and in uh, actual build pipelines you can actually deploy to a target environment maybe your Kubernetes cluster uh, deploy Pumba as well uh, using daemon sets so that it's available on every node and then schedule randomly bringing down node. Uh, containers or introducing loss and asserting the application's properties, you know, either in terms of consistency or availability or so on and so forth. Um, there are other tools, I believe, but uh, this is one of the tools some of our teams are using. Uh, and yeah, I mean, definitely uh, recommended based on the experience. Sounds, re sounds like a very, very useful tool. Uh, I, I definitely have to check it out. Quick uh, or random question on this. What's the startup time to get this uh, getting set up in a project? Just curious. Yeah, I mean, well, uh, definitely locally, it's very straightforward and simple. I can imagine a few hours having a basic setup going. Now, if, if you're going, the, the, I guess the problem is not doing the testing, it's automating it to assert on the application properties and figuring out. Uh, you know, over a period of time, how do you randomize it and stuff like that? I mean, that might take more time to sort of just like any test, right? Like your first test, hello world sort of test is straightforward, but beyond that, it's probably going to take a time. But definitely, I think it's uh, 
uh, it's simple enough that it's definitely worth at least doing the basics with it. Now, if you want to get more sophisticated, of course, you can build on top of it. Cool. Thanks. Uh, so the next blip is Azure Data Factory. Uh, I think uh, if we can go back a slide, it's we missed a blip. Uh, it's Azure Data Factory for orchestration, which is on hold. Curious, Jamak, could you tell us why? Sure. And Samia is my first witness. She is my witness about this one. So, um, actually, this is uh, this is I think one of the only blips that we have on hold on this radar. We are very you know cognizant and conscious of. Um, evaluating the, the, whatever we put on hold from so many different angles uh, to make sure we, you know, we are, uh, we're being fair. So uh, in terms of Azure Data Factory for orchestration, what, it, what is Azure, uh, Azure Data Factory? So if you're operating on Azure uh, platform and if you're having, building, you know, data platforms, data pipelines to um, move data around, transform it and use it for analytical purposes, uh, Azure Data Factory is essentially your default tool for orchestrating data processing pipelines, right? Um, it, it, it has a ton of connectors. Like it's, it's really easy to just pick it up as a default tool because it has numerous connectors in terms of um, input and output sync from where it can get data to where it can write data. And a lot of the data processing pipelines is around you know, extracting data from one data store and writing to you know, Azure Data Lake or picking it up from Azure Data Lake, putting in another store. And it's you know, the rich set of connectors that it has, it makes it kind of the default. And if you look at any of the solution architectures that Azure provides, it's the, the tool for uh, both copying data and transfer, transferring data from on-prem to cloud, or you know, running logics and orchestrating, executing logics of processing data. So what did we, why did we say put this on hold? We didn't say put Azure Data Factory on hold, we're actually using it, but what we say was, if you are using Azure Data Factory to orchestrate complex pipelines, right? Um, if you're using it like an Airflow tool that running the, you know, the DAG jobs that you have and it's, um, you know, orchestrating different kind of pieces of the logic for transformation, we would, uh, we would um, I guess, <laughs> warn you uh, about the, some of the rough edges that it has that really limits the developer experience. Uh, the challenges that we've had personally using the tool is that um, first and foremost, it feels like the, um, the, in terms of prioritization of the capabilities that it provides, um, Microsoft kind of pro, um, prioritizing the low code um, aspects of it. So, you know, drag and drop GUI base. So if you want to build a pipeline, you kind of have to get started with the GUI and that hardware has the richer experience. And then, you know, you can drop back into the code, which is a set of configurations of your pipelines and work from there. Uh, we really had um, a lot of challenges with de debugging it. Uh, so you get this hardly used Full, you know, kind of error messages that then you have to scratch the surface through multiple layers to really find out, oh, I had a typo somewhere, you know, in, in my script. Um, again, another um, challenge we had was, you know, when you're building, uh, is, is, it, is the observability an end-to-end -end observability? So when you're building a data processing pipeline, is the code is like in different parts of the, you know, parts of the ecosystem. So the data factory might be doing the copying job and running, executing the pipeline. And then the jobs that are, um, you know, processing different tasks within the pipelines, there might be on data breaks, you know, running Spark jobs. Um, so there is, uh, and, and, you know, your storage might be on Azure Data Lake, uh, storing, you know, calling APIs to storing or retrieving data. So if you want to have an end-to-end -end visibility, there is no way to get your logging messages kind of correlated across this disparate set of tools that Azure provides. Uh, and because Azure Data Factory is kind of the orchestrator, you kind of expect that uh, provides that end-to-end -end visibility, and that has been another challenge. So uh, what can you do instead? Um, uh, so I guess first and foremost, if you want to just using it for copying data from like on-prem to cloud or from one place to another, uh, that's kind of the, the limits of its usage that we are comfortable um, using. If you want to have, you know, orchestrators running job, uh, we had Airflow previously, it's an open source from Apache project that is on the radar, check it out. 
um, that's kind of the tool that we would be recommending using instead. Um, and hopefully, you know, over time, um, ADF kind of matures and um, the code first becomes the priority in terms of capabilities and these rough edges that we're seeing um, get addressed. Any, any questions, thoughts? No questions, I think, but uh, yeah, I did use this in my uh, project that I'm in and uh, like you said, it's uh, best for migrating inform or data from one place to another, but when it comes to orchestrating your workloads, it was uh, quite painful because of some of the ways um, it expects you to use that tool. Um, but uh, moving on, uh, the next, uh, we're, I guess we're going to talk about our theme that's going to be showing up in our tech radar, which is cloud is more less. Uh, so I think Jamak, you're speaking to this. Tell us more. Sounds interesting. Sure. Um, so we had a lot of discussions around this, to be honest. We had um, long sessions of challenges that we are facing with kind of the services and products of the cloud providers. I think we have, you know, the cloud providers um, have passed the moments of parity, right? That, you know, getting enough maturity and parity of capabilities to run web applications, to run microservices, you know, to run our operational systems. And now they are in this, you know, competition frenzy to go beyond that, you know, and provide everybody's in the race to get your data on the cloud, getting your data jobs, ML, you know, those cognitive services. There's a whole lot of services that are just now being kind of added beyond what we're, you know, beyond the products or services that allowed us to tip our toes into the cloud and put our applications, simple applications and web applications on the cloud. So what's happening, what, what we are observing is this um, kind of marketing and product development approach that it's just like the number of products that are being thrown at us is, is, is difficult to grasp and it's difficult to kind of catch up with, right? And you just have to go to the list of services that each of the cloud providers um, bringing up. And what we are seeing is that the, the cost of this um, constantly throwing out new products and to, to, to get, you know, market share, to be different from the other one, the cost of that is externalized to us. And there are a couple of challenges that we're seeing. One is the products that are being told as GA, you know, general availability, they're really not in general, what I would expect to be general availability um, condition. Um, you know, you're seeing doc products that are coming out with poor documentation, difficult to automate, um, bugs, like plain, just like having bugs and downtimes. Um, so, you know, not having security building, not having debuggability built in. So um, be very aware of that. Just because a cloud provider tells this is general availability, do your homework, do your research, and really see does or is the product, does the product have the maturity you need uh, to take it on board? And if it doesn't, you've got to wait a little bit. The other side effect of this, you know, constant competition to throw more products out there is this disconnected of the disconnection of products within the ecosystem of the cloud provider. Like we're seeing a lot of products that are coming out, um, you know, that don't, don't play nicely with each other. It's really hard to integrate one um, with the other. And I'm not trying to hear to name names, to be honest. Um, you can do your own research. Um, I have to say that probably out of all of the cloud providers, GCP differentiates itself in terms of the quality of the services come out and they have rough edges as well. And, you know, um, all of them kind of more or less have, have similar um, behavior just because of the, uh, you know, the, the development practices within the cloud providers that different teams are building different services. So the integration becomes a bit difficult. Um, and also this kind of time to market trade-off um, that is externalizing a whole bunch of um, immaturity costs to us. 
Um, and again, uh, we know that the you know decision around what cloud provider to go with it's not a decision that a developer makes on the ground, right? It's a decision that is made at different levels for different variety of reasons. Um, and one of those reasons might be tech maturity or tech capability. There are other reasons in terms of the support that management feels the cloud providers gives them, you know, extra, you know, kind of benefits or value add services that they would get. So um, just because a product is listed on the cloud provider, it doesn't mean it's the right fit for you or it's the right fit for you right now in time. So do your due diligence and do your research be before you're jumping in. And in some cases, to be honest, maybe, you know, using an open source, whether it's managed or your self-managed um, option might be the route to go. I know that um, a lot of executives and people who are making, um, you know, decisions and spending their money, they would be happy the more icons that the cloud provider provides as a managed service on your architecture, you know, the better that architecture is because it means they don't have to worry about security. They don't have to worry about, you know, kind of like some of the liabilities and they don't have to worry about, you know, managing that service locally and all the overhead that comes with it. But at the same time, there is the, you know, the counter side of that is that those managed, you know, logos or products that provide by the cloud providers sometimes just don't fit the architecture, they don't fit the integration model, they don't you know, have the maturity. So just um, consider that in your trade-offs uh, when you're picking um, you know, a cloud provider uh, service at a point in time. So stop, uh, I stop here. We, we had a lot of uh, um, kind of data points in terms of products, specific products that we wanted to put on hold and especially around kind of the data and ML platform, there's a fair bit of maturity there. Um, but we decided to just, just, just go with the theme because it's very difficult to kind of like go into every single, um, you know, every single product that may not be mature today. Yeah. So uh, just checking in on some of the questions, I think one is related to this. Uh, it asks, how would you group each CSP based on their strengths? For example, GCP is better at ML and AWS better at traditional infrastructure. Oh, Jamak, you're muted, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's hard to group. To be honest, it's a shifting landscape. So even if we put, and GCP was, and perhaps it still is, um, one of the leading platforms in terms of the capability around data. But you, if you actually look at the market share, um, Azure is winning a lot of the data um, kind of um, uh, data related projects and it's this is a strong second right now. Um, and it's based, it's not because it, again, the decision making of the grouping is not just technically I have mature, you know, capable products. It's also, you know, I'm running Databricks, I'm offering Databricks as a partner, I'm offering, you know, um, consulting services, so there's a other things. So you're right, you probably, there are strengths of one versus the other, and GCP has been a um, strong contender in terms of the data. But again, the, the approach that Azure taking is, like if you look at the list of managed open source services that are just continuously adding to their services and partnering with other, you know, um, kind of service providers, they're strengthening their platform. So it's a shifting, shifting landscape for sure. So whatever I would say today may not be true um, tomorrow. Cool. Uh, so just keeping time in mind, I guess we can kind of move on to the next set of uh, blips. Uh, the next one is data mesh. It's on you, Jamak, again. Tell us what, what it entails. Okay, right. This is, this is my baby. So I'm, I'm very happy and <laughs> excited about seeing this on here. And I, um, it's, it's basically data mesh. I don't know. Um, there is, there is um, definitely, I can, I can drop the uh, blog post on this. Data mesh is a um, architectural style that is essentially challenging um, the paradigm of big data management that we have adopted for almost 50 years now from the early 70s, from data warehousing to data lake and now data lake on the cloud. Um, and it, the way it's, we are kind of challenging the, the, the existing paradigm is that the existing paradigm you know, is based on centralization. 
the dream of the CIOs for 30, 40 years has been get the data out of, out of the silos of databases or application databases in one place so we can get our arms around it so we can look at it and analyze it from different places. And we often end up with you know, a centralized team looking, at, looking after that data platform, data lake, data warehouse. And even though um, you know, we have had some sort of an incremental improvements around that paradigm, like for example, we had data warehousing, which was about you know, get the data into the warehouse, transform it before you get it in there into some sort of a magical star schema or snowflake schema so we can run all sorts of query on this very complex model. And we improved it, moved to data lake, and we said, okay, don't worry about that transformation because we understand that's, that's not a viable solution as the, com you know, the complexity of domains increase. Just put the data into the lake, into its original format. And now we build this lakeshore marks that you know, you know, model the data for particular usage. Um, we have had, so we have had those incremental improvements. But what we're seeing is that companies at scale are essentially still challenged with getting, you know, harnessing that data, using data as asset, really um, changing their business, um, competing on data. So data mesh adopts kind of the best ingredients or most successful, you know, best ingredients of most successful kind of data projects that we've done globally uh, and apply modern architecture um, principles and practices that we have had into operational world and bring that to the data world. Essentially, it's based on the principles, the four, four underlying principles, um, applying, you know, instead of thinking about your data platform as a you know, labyrinth of pipelines, Think about your data platform as this ecosystem of domain-oriented data sets, immutable kind of time series or time snapshots, um, data sets that are oriented around the domain. Uh, so domain thinking really becomes, or the domain boundaries becomes the axis based on which you decompartmentalize your architecture. Uh, the second angle to it is, the second practice within it is that there is a lot of, once you decentralize, um, you know, immutable analytical data, data sets, uh, there's a lot of, you know, tech overhead, right? It's not easy to manage storage for each of these independently. It's not easy to manage clusters of running jobs for each of these. So all of the technical overhead and complexity to run, you know, these domain as independent data sets that can be consumed by anyone who has access to, there, then we want to abstract those complexity into this layer we call kind of data infrastructure, self-serve data infrastructure. And Samia is actually a lead on um, a project that building that kind of layer that really allows building these domain-oriented data sets more easily. Um, you know, you don't need to have a PhD in data engineering to actually set up one of these things. It's, it's just very, very simple self-serve. Um, the third principle of that is really think about these domain uh, oriented analytical data sets as products. So we call them actually data products and really bring product thinking um, to these um, um, domain oriented data sets. And what that means is, um, you know, avoid having these silos of undiscoverable data buried somewhere, make the data discoverable, make the data addressable, make it secure, make it interoperable, and actually have people whose job is, their role accountability is to be the product owner, the data product owners for these you know, data sets. Go out there in the organization, evangelize the availability of the data set, think about the life cycle, the quality of the data, measure the quality of the data. And then their job is essentially remove a lot of friction and overhead that exists you know, for any data user, whether it's a data analyst, data scientist, ML engineer, you know, remove the friction that they're facing to actually find the data that's available to them and then make sense of it and use it remove that overhead. And finally, for any distributed system to work, the fourth principle underneath this is um, interoperability. So what sort of you know, standardization we need to put in place so the data from one domain can be joined and correlated from, with another domain. Um, I will drop the link to one of the early blog posts and um, there will be more kind of, um, and there are podcasts and um, talks and so on on the internet on data mesh. So we are, we are assessing this, we are starting to use it. We're seeing a huge, um, I guess, a lot of interest uh, from the industry because the pains are real. Um, and hopefully with your help um, and everybody on this call, we can kind of evolve it and iterate over it moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, it's been interesting uh, implementing this architecture in our current project. Uh, and hopefully we'll uh, be sharing more of what's happening around that in other forms of 
uh, ways outside of this webinar. Um, so moving on to the next uh, blip, Bert. Um, Sudarshan, I believe you were gonna tell us how we're going to use, or how we've been using it and why we recommend it. Uh, yes, Samia. So BERT uh, is a technique for NLP TAS. Um, it stands for uh, bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. I mean, when I read it, I understood none of those words <laughs> independently, but essentially uh, what it is, it's a technique which was described in a Google paper, which was published uh, last year. And what was interesting about it is they managed to get uh, state-of-the-art results in a wide range of NLP tasks. Um, it's sort of coming at a point in time which is interesting for NLP because uh, last two, three years have been quite transformational in the field of NLP in the sense there have been a lot of innovations, there have been a lot of uh, research results. Um, in fact, in the previous edition of the REDA, we talked about transfer learning in NLP uh, becoming a lot more viable and possible. Um, and the, the, the general idea of transfer learning is that, uh, you know, you have, um, you don't need to train your model from scratch. You can take a model which has already been trained on some standard data sets and then uh, tune it to your data set and you get good enough results. So in a sense, you're, you're, you're standing on the shoulder of giant sort of thing. Um, and, and transfer learning in NLP, uh, it's always been a big in computer vision. Uh, where you know neural networks are trained on ImageNet database, and then we fine-tune the model on our uh, for our needs. But now we talked about how it was possible in NLP as well. Now, Bert built builds on top of a lot of these um, techniques, um, like your ELMO, your LMFET, uh, transformers, etc. And uh, what, the key innovation of Bert was in applying uh, bidirectional training to language modeling. What that means is. Um, you know, when it was, uh, when, when it looks at uh, words in a sentence uh, and to understand the context, uh, the previous methods would either look at the sentence from left to right or right to left and the context, some of the context would be lost. Uh, Bert figured out a way uh, to look at a, a word in a sentence, uh, uh, you know, taking the full sentence into consideration so you get the full context. Uh, the results of it is that, the, uh, you know, you can see that the language model uh, which has been trained bidirectionally like this uh, using BERT has a much deeper sense of the context. Um, now what Google did was along with a the paper, they open sourced the code and also, and this was key, they made available a group of models pre-trained using BERT on a large corpus of data. Right? This was, uh, I think they trained it on Wikipedia and a, a book corpus. Um, and what this means is that projects like us, we can actually take these models uh, which contain all these word embeddings um, and, and use them as a starting point for our tasks. And with very little data, with uh, basic effort, uh, we can get some pretty good results in NLP. A few of our projects uh, have started using it and, um, and, and they, they do feel that, you know, they're getting pretty good output with, uh, you know, with, with, with a lot less effort than before. So yeah, that's, that's good. So I'm curious, are, is this something that you would use with uh, conversational agents or what are some uh, use cases where you would want to use BERT? Yeah, so it's, it's a most a typical NLP task, right? Like, so if, uh, a very common use case would be if you are, for example, building a chatbot uh, or if you're building a translation engine, this is in fact the example which uh, one of our projects we are using, we are building translations in Indian languages uh, and BERT would be a great, uh, was a great choice there. Uh, and if you're doing other sorts of problems like summarization and so on and so forth, and, or if you have some entity recognition problems, then uh, BERT would be a good candidate. Okay. Uh, so moving on, uh, binary attestation. I believe, Yamak, you were gonna speak sure. to Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if you folks have heard of um, uh, software supply chain. It's a big topic and a trend right now. I was at QCon San Francisco yesterday and they had a whole track associated with software supply chain. So uh, software supply chain um, kind of processes and practices in general are around getting visibility and security and conformance and all of the quality 
uh, that we need to have in place to trust the software, the origin of it, and what processes it has gone through before it can be deployed to production. And because the, the, you know, the our ecosystem of like applications are becoming much, much more complex, you have like tons of, you know, microservices running around, you have data jobs running around. There's just this, this very complex, you know, ecosystem. We need to get, you know, automated processes in place that can be guarantee that a piece of software that is going to production is the one that we trust. We know the origin of it and we know whether it has gone through all of the kind of automated testing and verification. So one of the kind of techniques in that process of tons of different techniques around it. Uh, but there's one technique that we, is called binary attestation uh, and is essentially um, uh, cryptographically an attester, you know, a deploy time or, you know, a build time kind of um, automated process or a manual process, ideally automated process, attests and verifies that the binary image is now authorized for deployment. So you can add that to somewhere in your pipeline, in your CD pipeline before, you know, after you've done through the testing, after you've done through the audit, after you've done your, you know, security checks that required. Um, and then at the time of deployment, then, you know, that deployment tool verifies that whether this binary has been authorized or not. Uh, there are actually lots of different tools. So we would have the tools published as part of the Take Radar. Um, uh, for example, the GCP binary authorization, which is a suite of kind of the processes and tools that they have, has a binary attestation built in. Um, there is in total, there is um, Docker notary. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher this one, Graphis, <laughs> I'll butcher the name, uh, G-R-A-F-E-A-S, Graphis, which was the, uh, the, the tooling that actually Google used. Uh, so there are, I guess, a lot of options available to validate, to actually put the signature um, on the binaries uh, to verify that there are, and verify those signatures cryptographically before um, deploying. Thank you. Uh... So just a time check, uh, it's 7.47 a.m. in California, I guess. So we have about 13 minutes left. Uh, so the next one uh, is Open Policy Agent, I believe. Sure, I think it's the last one here. Um, so this is a wonderful little project. It's actually bigger than a little project, I think, um, that has an open source component to it and has also a company behind it for commercial support. Open policy agents, actually, let me step back for a minute. What is one of the, what, what do you guys think? What's one of the hardest thing to do in, you know, distributed a polyglot um, ecosystem? Um, and don't tell me cap theorem and transactions. One of the hardest thing to do is applying and enforcing, defining and enforcing um, security policies uniformly across the landscape of technologies that you're using. It's just, it's just impossible right now. If you want to secure you know, how your services are being accessed versus how your Kubernetes API is being accessed versus your database, you know, authorized who can access your database, you're dealing with three different, you know, already three different ways of applying that. Um, An open policy agent or OPA tries to solve that problem. So what they've done is they've come up with a kind of a language wiggle where you can define programmatically uh, fine grain access control, who with what, you know, and they're using, sorry, they're using um, um, JAWS and um, OpenID Connect and a whole bunch of like, you know, the open standards. So, uh, you know, what entity a person or a service with what uh, characteristic, what role, what email can access what APIs. And then you can kind of bundle um, these policies and deploy them as part of this agent as a sidecar with your service. So when the, and, and this service then integrates with whatever other, you know, services intercepting the traffic, whether the actual application or you're in a, some sort of a service mesh environment with Envoy or other, you know, proxies that are sitting in, in um, between your inbound and outbound traffic. And it, it checks and enforces those policies. So it tries to kind of unify the way that we're doing policy definition and enforcement and also distribute that to, to the kind of to, to the ecosystem. They're currently support um, uh, the same language and the same mechanics support um, the Kubernetes API, you know, who can deploy what, doc, you know, what image, 
where um, the microservices API, just the HTTP API, they can also do, I think, I believe Kafka, and I think on their roadmap, they have different various databases and data stores that they want to put OPA in front of. It's actually one of the CNCF um, projects in the incubation phase. So we're hoping that, you know, they get a bit of support uh, from the open source community and CNCF to grow that beyond just the microservices. Um, um, model. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this project and it's in an access. Um, we're looking at using it, um, definitely using it at, the, at different projects to start using it. And we really hope that they can kind of grow to just beyond, you know, the, the, the filtering and the access control for microservices and start looking at the databases because databases are some of the kind of most proprietary and fragmented part of the, um, part of the ecosystem when it comes to authorization and access control. Thank you. Uh, so moving on, I think the last bits are on uh, Sudarshan. Uh, Flutter, that's another interesting name. Tell yes. us more. <laughs> yes, thank you, Samia. Yes, so um, the last bit for today is Flutter. Um, so Flutter is a, a cross-platform framework uh, for mobile development. Um, it, uh, it's based on a language called Dart. It's from Google. Um, it's um, it's it's unlike React Native in a sense because you know while React Native compiles uh, React code to native components, Flutter does not use any native components at all. It directly compiles to machine code on ARM or x64, um, which basically means that uh, Flutter controls the rendering of pixels on the screen directly. Um, you know they support uh, 60 frames per second, and if well hardware supports it, 120 frames per second. Um, we actually had Flutter in Assess, the previous two editions, um, uh, but this time we decided to move to trial because we had actually seen a few projects reach production with it and uh, you know, we, we felt very happy with it and felt it deserved um, a billing into trial. Uh, what are the key selling points of Flutter? I mean, one of course is the performance and some reports suggest that in some benchmarks, like it, it can actually outperform uh, you know, Android or um, I, uh, Swift directly, but um, you know what? But the other key selling point, apart from performance, is, is the whole dev experience. It, it's quite a delight to work with. Um, you know, when when developing, uh, for example, if you're, it uses the Dart VM in a just-in-time compilation mode, which means you get hot reload. Like as you're typing in the changes, you can see the impact immediately uh, and stuff like that. And, and uh, what's amazing, it also works for stateful stuff, right? Like the state is preserved and you can see the changes with the state. Uh, what One of the interesting things, uh, anecdotally, for, about Dart itself, right? Like Dart uh, originally was introduced by Google back in 2011 or 12, and it's a language specialized for the UI. And originally they built it uh, because they, their idea was to embed Dart VMs in browsers uh, and potentially uh, use it as a replacement for JavaScript. Uh, and back then, I think we even had it on the tech radar, but on hold, interestingly enough. Uh, of course, since then, it's evolved uh, quite a bit. But Google, at some point, because of the community backlash about, uh, around it, uh, changed tack, and they moved away from using it uh, as a potential replacement for JavaScript. But what that does mean is that because Flutter is built on Dart, um, it actually has a, a transpiler where Dart to JS, where uh, you know, so basically because of that, Flutter can also run on the web. Um, and there's support for desktops. Um, and there's, uh, there's reports about Google Futria, which is a new operating system by Google, where apparently Flutter is, uh, Flutter's the language or way in which to create apps for Futria. So there's a lot of potential for Flutter. And if, you, if all you're looking for is mobile app dev, definitely recommend it. But either way, I think uh, something definitely to keep an eye on. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so wrapping up on the last uh, theme for this sneak peek webinar is interpreting the black box of ML. This is one of my favorite topics, I think. So looking forward to hearing from me on this version. Yeah. So yeah, this is a theme, interpreting the black box of machine learning. Um, I mean, generally our themes are uh, topics which get discussed a lot when we come up with a radar. Um, and this definitely was one of those topics. Um, in, in the previous few radars, there's always a lot of machine learning related 
uh, blips in every radar. Uh, and increasingly, you know, there's a lot of sophistication in the engineering around machine learning. We talked about CI, CD for ML and stuff previously. But as some of these engineering challenges are sorted, there are more complex challenges uh, that we are starting to tackle, um, you know, things related to data ethics and interpretability and model fairness and stuff like that. These are not just stuff you read in the newspapers when, uh, you know, Facebook or Microsoft shows up. Uh, it's stuff that uh, is relevant and, uh, you know, stuff that we are talking about in our projects with our product owners and our clients. Um, the, the, inherently, of course, we all know that many machine learning models are opaque and some more opaque than others, um, where it's not easy to uh, explain the results in terms of logical inference. Um, but it is something which, as, as the ubiquity of ML's application increases, and you're working in more uh, regulated industries or in industries where it's very important to understand uh, the reasoning behind the results of a model's application, uh, it's becoming, this is an increasingly important area for us. Uh, of course, beyond this, there's also another uh, reason, which is uh, security, risk of security attacks, because you know, the, how do you know if your model has been tampered or not? Uh, Shamak talked about supply chain and binary attestation and stuff. How do you know that your model um, you know, hasn't been tampered if you continue to treat it as a black box? Like, uh, particularly in the training phase, someone goes and tinkers with it, you have no clue really, because you don't really understand how, uh, why the results are what they are anyway. I mean, if you went back a few years, uh, there were uh, that's a sort of uh, there is of course tooling to help with this and research to help with this. A few years ago, a lot of our models were based on decision trees, and we used to have tools like Tree Interpreter, which is a Python library, to help us understand it. And then we got um, Shap, uh, which is a tool which sort of looked at all the explainability methods uh, in the research domain at that time and attempted to unify them as uh, in one tool. Um, now we are st starting to see a new generation of tools, tools like What If tool, uh, which is also in the radar this time. It's, it's, it's a tool by Google, um, and it helps data scientists to dig into their model's behavior, where you can tinker with the features, uh, look at the data, change the data sets, look at the output, you get some interesting visualizations, um, and can also help you, it, it basically it helps you gain insight into the model behavior. One interesting thing, I, I've heard of a few of our projects where the data centers say that you know, it's such an important thing that they actually make decisions on which model to use based on explainability rather than on the, uh, you know, the, the correctness of the model or the accuracy of the results. And that, that, that shows that this is becoming a first class citizen as an NFR, not just you know, the accuracy of the model. Um, uh, and of course, uh, with all the tooling there uh, surrounding it, it's now more tractable and it's now more possible to reason about it as well. Uh, so that's that's uh, interpreting the black box of machine learning as a theme. Thank you. Uh, so just wrapping up, uh, uh, thanks, uh, Jamaka and Sudarshan, for giving us a sneak peek on what's coming up in our uh, most recent Tech Radar. Uh, I don't think we have time for that many questions. Uh, maybe one, I think uh, there was one around, uh, trying to see, uh, let's see. Oops, sorry. Uh, the, uh, around Graal VM, I think one question was, would you advocate an approach to upgrade existing applications to use Graal VM to gain some of the JIT? or the just-in-time advantages? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's definitely at a point where it's worth trying it out. Now, of course, uh, benchmarks vary, and you know, GraalVM performs better in some benchmarks than others. Um, I think the, one of the things to uh, sort of check is in your context, uh, because particularly where uh, we have uh, some of the long-running workloads, uh, it's important to sort of try it out and test. So at this point, I would say definitely, yes, try it out, see if it works. If the results uh, pan out, I think it's well worth replacing our existing VM at Gradient. Well, thank you everyone for attending uh, for and for the questions and comments. Uh, really appreciate uh, everyone joining in and talking about what's coming up. Thanks everyone.